Good morning, everybody. You already talk about some pharmacology? Eight hours of farm. I mean, how exciting is that? Right? So uh, I'm from Nashville. I'm a professor at Vanderbilt University. I teach there with our acute care and emergency nurse practitioner program. I practice as an emergency and flight nurse practitioner there at Vanderbilt and also with Team Health. Been with the core EM faculty for the boot camp since we started this, and it's just grown tremendously. So what we're going to do is talk about some common medications that we may be prescribing there in emergency care settings, but also some of those medications that we may encounter that our patients are taking. Most of us are probably not prescribing a lot of the immunosuppressants that are out there, like a lot of our biologic agents. But we'll talk about some of the key caveats and things that are really important for us to know as the clinician we're caring for those patients. So first off this morning, we'll talk about antimicrobial therapy and kind of do a quick review of an empiric approach a lot of things out there that we encounter and that we deal with in these scenarios, especially now as we're entering cold and flu season, what are the current CDC guidelines and when should we use antivirals and when should we just recommend conservative therapy. So we'll talk about some of these mechanisms of action, these common medications, and then lastly, how do we really focus on empiric therapy to make sure we're using the appropriate agents. And one of the key caveats with that is to always consider that we talk about a lot of regional resistance issues and problems, and then what may work for me in Tennessee may not work for you if we're in the West Coast or up North, and definitely it's important to be aware of what is out there for you as a resource in your area. If your hospital uses an antibiogram or you have access to one, that's a phenomenal resource as well. So just a quick review of microbiology, because everybody loved that course, right? Or that courses in microbiology. But think about the difference in those bacteria that we deal with, in the cell wall, is one of the things that really differentiate them from other organisms. And outside of mycoplasma, they have that cell wall, which differentiates from us and a lot of other animal species. And one of the nice things there is a lot of our antibiotics address that cell wall, which really helps limit the interactions for us since we do not have that. So it gives it that great protection, but then our antibiotics can go in there and attack that cell wall and either impair its ability to be repaired or for it to be developed, and that hopefully allows us to destroy that bacterium. So the gram stain really helps us to differentiate quickly whether we're talking about a gram negative or a gram positive. So our gram negatives don't take on the gram stain, but they do take on that saffron stain. They have this kind of more complex three-layer wall that has some different stuff in there compared to our gram positives, and those three layers are important but it does tend to differ it from our gram positives, which only has those two layers. And this gram positive layer has this glycopeptin wall and the plasma membrane as well, and both these are gonna release those toxins. And those toxins, when we're talking about the endo or the exotoxins, is what usually triggers the activation of our sepsis response in the body that causes the initial response of the vasodilation and then the release of all our inflammatory mediators we look at this, that gram negative has a lot thinner wall, but it's more complex overall, where our gram positive has that very thick wall, but it doesn't have as many layers. And so that's why some antibiotics work better at one than the other, depending upon the organism, depending on how complex that cell wall is. We talk about our antibiotics, we used to talk about them in two classes. Are these agents gonna be bacterial static? Are they just going to slow down and inhibit growth? Or are they going to be bactericidal? They're actually going to be really effective at going in there and destroying the bacteria. And the big thing here is what's the patient's host immune system? If your patient's immune compromised, they're critically ill, they don't have an intact immune system, then it's very important that we consider a bactericidal agent. But if that patient's immune competent, we're talking about some community acquired infection, they're probably going to be managed on an outpatient basis, then a bacterial static agent may be all they need. We just want to make sure we're picking the right agent for treating this patient because this is your patient who is immune suppressed. There are immunosuppressants. They're currently being treated for chemotherapy. And that patient probably needs to be getting a cytal agent at least to make sure their immune system doesn't have to work as hard. And then we other talk about the antibiotics based on these five mechanisms of action. How do they work? And one of our big ones I've already alluded to is our cell wall inhibitors. That's your beta-lactams your penicillins, your cephalosporins, your carbapenems, and our one monobactam. They're really gonna go in there and attack and destroy that cell wall and allow the body to take care of the rest. But we also have other agents that are very effective in that category. This gets in our glycopeptide agents like vancomycin, which is not a beta-lactam, but affects that cell wall also. 
And then our cell membrane inhibitors, there's only a few in this class, so it's one we don't use a whole lot. This is like polymyxin. We talk about a lot of our topical things or some of our odoc or ophthalmic drops, but amphotericin B actually falls in this category as well. And the other big group that we usually use that's bactericidal is going to be our nucleic acid synthesis inhibitors. And this includes our quinolones. And a lot of stuff out there, and we'll come back to the quinolones in a little bit, and a lot of their bad press, but as we've used them longer and longer, we've learned some of the bad things that happen with using these quinolones, but also things like rifampin. And a lot of our antivirals fall in this category. And they go in there and affect the ability for it to reproduce or for it to produce its nucleic acid. And then we have our ribosome synthesis inhibitors, our macrolides, our tetracyclines, and these tend to be more bacterial static. So they do rely upon that host immune system to be more effective. Now some of these agents may have qualities of both. So at lower concentrations, they're bacterial static, but at full concentration, they're bacterial cytal. And we'll sometimes see that with like the fluoroquinolones. At full dose, those fluoroquinolones are bacterial cytal, but as the half-life starts to get it, implemented and we start getting a drop in the concentration, it still has some post-antibiotic effects. So it may still have some static properties for several days, even after the course of therapy has been completed. And then lastly, we have our cell membrane modifiers, or sometimes referred to as our folic acid synthesis inhibitors or our metabolite inhibitors. Our big one here are things like our sulfonamides. These are going to go in there and affect the folic acid cycle. Unlike us, bacteria cannot use exogenous folic acid. They have to produce their own. So these agents go in there and inhibit that process, and without folic acid, they're not going to be able to pr procreate, they're not going to be able to carry on, and eventually they will die. So we use some of these agents also. And that's why we may sometimes use agents from different classes because they have different mechanisms of action. And definitely thinking about this patient, is it an intact immune system? or is it an immune system that's been altered, we may need to use that cytal versus that static agent. So I just want to kind of give you an idea, an update, on some of the different types of agents that are out there and some of the examples. If you don't use GoodRx, it's a really good tool to use, especially if you have patients who don't have access to prescription coverage, and really can help us find that drug for that patient, and here's a reasonable source to go get it. But if you use the app, just download it, put in the medication, It'll tell you what around you has it and what their cost is. And that really can be a big factor for a lot of patients if they don't have prescription coverage or even if they have limited resources. That, hey, at this pharmacy, it's only 40 bucks. At this pharmacy, it's 120 bucks. So we just kind of refresh your mind on some of these agents like our penicillins, lots of those out there. And some may be in combination, some may be by themselves. So like augmentin with clavulanic acid or augmentin. What does that clavulanic acid do? And the big thing to think about here is we have so much resistance now. We have a lot of bacteria that produce those beta-lactamases. They're going to damage that beta-lactam ring, which is really important for the function of the antibiotic. So if we're seeing those combination drugs, such as here, clavulanate or clavulanic acid is a beta-lactamase inhibitor. So it's going to allow that antibiotic to be effective. It's going to inhibit the enzyme our bacteria are now producing, trying to fight off our antibiotics. We're smart, they're smart as well, so we have to keep getting smarter. Our carbapenems, like Mirum and Dorabax, our sulfosporins, those tend to all be considered to be cross-reactive and cross-effective. So if you have a patient who's highly allergic to a penicillin, that may be the case for a cephalosporin or a carbapenem. If it's a mild reaction, then probably they're not gonna have that cross-reactivity. But estimate about 5% of people that are truly allergic to one of these drugs may have that risk of cross-reactivity with one of the other family members. So it's always important to ask, what's your allergy to penicillin? Oh, a little rash, probably not a big deal when we get up to our higher generation cephalosporins like ceftriaxone or to our carbapenems. But there's always a concern, so definitely keep that in mind. The monobactam, the only one we have, azotram, is similarly but doesn't have that risk. So if someone truly is allergic to penicillin or cephalosporin or carbapenem, then a monobactam doesn't have that risk, and that may be a good alternative in those scenarios. Fluoroquinolones, definitely good agents for a lot of our complicated infections, pulmonary infections, sometimes our GIGU infections. So there's several of those out there. We often talk about those that are just purely respiratory quinolones, and that's your agents except for Cipro. Cipro tends to be referred to as below the diaphragm or below the belt. 
It only really covers most of our GI, GU bugs, but unfortunately due to a lot of use in the last 10, 15 years, the resistance is pretty high in a lot of areas. But if we're trying to treat one of those respiratory infections or sepsis, it definitely needs to be a respiratory quinolone. So Levaquin or Mox, those also tend to have really good antipseudomonal properties. So definitely your nursing home patient or your hospitalized patient and worry about pseudomonas, those tend to be really good agents. But now they have several box warnings out about their use and their risk for complications. The macrolides, lots of those out there. Azithro has been used a lot. Unfortunately, its resistance rate has increased as well. So we talk about these adverse drug reactions. There's a lot of intolerances out there. And that's your patient who gets the GI distress. They may have some nausea. They may even have some diarrhea with it. And that's just an intolerance. It's not a true allergic reaction. And unfortunately, we know that when we use antimicrobial agents, they're also going to alter the normal flora of the gut. And we see a lot of problems with that as well. And we may talk about, in some cases, recommending prebiotics or even probiotics, which may help decrease that risk. But definitely that allergic response is something we have to ask about. What was the allergy? I don't know, my mother just told me years ago I had a reaction to penicillin. Well, that may or may not be a true reaction, depends on the scenario, but something we need to ask about, decide is the risk there or not. Typically, if they're truly allergic to first generation, about 5%, as I mentioned, risk for a cross reaction. But if they just have a little mild reaction and now we're using a third or fourth generation cephalosporin, the risk is pretty low. But definitely think about using your clinical decision making in that and decide with your clinical gestalt is it the risk or not? As I allude to the super infections, definitely are one of the things we have to think about. As we use these antibiotics, they're very effective in treating what we're trying to treat, but we also alter the normal flora. We know that just one round of antibiotics is enough to alter our GI flora, but also the normal flora in our skin. And patients that are higher risk, they're already immune suppressed, maybe at risk for developing C. diff infections or fungal infections like Canada. Unfortunately, C. diff has become a big problem in a lot of our areas, and actually now it's now considered to be a community-acquired infection in some areas. We see so many people that have C. diff, not doing good hand washing, they lead the bacterium somewhere, somebody else picks it up, and now they get a C. diff infection as well. So that's definitely part of our decision-making. should be part of the risk, especially when we're talking with patients about why we're not going to prescribe antimicrobial agents or trying to save them from some kind of bad infection like C. diff. And a lot of these agents also have that risk for renal insult. Some of these are going to be actively have active metabolites, which may affect renal function. Some of these are going to go very little hepatic transformation, and so they're going to flow through the kidneys unaffected. And so we have to consider that as well. And we'll talk about some of those higher risk medications as we move throughout. So as I alluded to at the very beginning, resistance is definitely a big concern. And as we become smarter, we've evolved with our knowledge, so are our bacteria. And they developed the ability to produce those enzymes I mentioned earlier, like the beta-lactamases. And now we're also seeing carbapenemases and cephalosporinases. And those enzymes are actually to go in there and attack the bacteria is to defend themselves. So now we've got a lot of these combination drugs trying to prevent that. And now we're getting where we have antibiotics that are no longer effective and they used to work really well. And we've got some infections, we no longer have really good agents to treat them. Like now we talk about gonorrhea. We're getting to cases of Ceftrax and resistant gonorrhea. So now the recommendation is we hit them with two antibiotics always because of that. If we can't cure gonorrhea, what's next? So those are things we've got to think about and definitely having stewardship is really important for these patients. Some of them can alter their cell wall. We'll see that with the MRSA and several other bacteria and they're actually able to go in there and replace something or remove a pore or hide it. So those antibiotics we use have got to get inside the cell wall to be effective. But what about that entry point if it's removed or it's hidden? And now we can't get our antibiotic in. And we've actually found that antibiotics become less effective when they're used longer, of course, but bacteria also have the ability to share genetic information. And there's been several studies they've looked at, they'll place under the electron microscope a E. coli bacterium that is not resistant to anything and one that is resistant and you actually can watch this fimbriae come out, and the one that's resistant shares its genetic information with the other one, and over time, that other bacterium now becomes resistant. They share information just like we do, and that's why stewardship is so important. Some develops these efflux pumps. We said a lot with their fluoroquinolones, and the bacterium actually developed the ability to pump out the antibiotic, 
that are detected in cytoplasm and detected inside and actually can push it out. So now the antibiotic can't reach minimum effective concentration inside the bacteria and be effective. So there's just some of the things we run into with resistance. It's pretty impressive. They're smart, we have to be smarter. But there's lots of other things that play a role with resistance as well. There's lots of discussions about agriculture and the role of antibiotics in use in livestock and other animal products and how that may infect. But also when antibiotics end up in the sewer system and end up in the water supply. So there's lots of concerns out there. And definitely it falls to us as clinicians to really be good stewards and educate people about why this viral infection doesn't require antibiotics. And we know over time that what we've got now is not going to be effective and there's less new antibiotics produced every year. We haven't had any major breakthroughs in a while, some great new class, so trying to focus on these and how we try to do that and the importance of just education and shared decision making. So we talk about patient management. The goal is to start out empiric, so based upon the site or what we suspect is the site of infection. We hope, think it's urinary, we think it's pulmonary, we think it's a skin infection. But then hopefully get our gram stain soon and identify, hey, is this gram negative or is this gram positive? So at least it helps us differentiate what the organism is, what we might be trying to treat. And then try to get down to definitive therapy as soon as possible. And for most of us, that may take 48 hours to get those cultures back. But those can definitely help our inpatient colleagues, or sometimes even us in the ED, narrow that spectrum as soon as possible. So if I'm admitting that patient with a community-acquired pneumonia, and we've already got them on azithro and ceftraxone, and figure out, hey, it's not an atypical, we can take the azithro away. And that's really our goal, is trying to limit that, be appropriate, but also recognize when I no longer need certain agents and get those out. And as I alluded to earlier, definitely got to consider your resistance, regional resistance, because that definitely can play a role in what may work for me, but may not work for you. Some of you work at a facility that produces their own antibiogram. We usually get ours every six months and they revise it. If your hospital doesn't publish its own antibiogram, there are usually regional ones published by the CDC that kind of give you an idea of what's out there. And what this antibiogram does is look at what isolates we've seen in the last six months, the last year, and tell us, hey, here's what we're seeing a lot of and allows us to get an idea of what really works against this specific species. At some facilities, your hospital may have three or four antibiograms, one for inpatient units and one for ICUs, and then some even do some for uh, fungal infections as well. But literally help us differentiate to go, here's what's really working currently to treat these types of pathogens. And this may alter what's on your formulary, so every six months we change what our first-line agents are for community-acquired pneumonia or what we're using for fungal infections. So what happens every six months every year it's published and gives us an idea of what's there. This is one from a couple of years ago from an institution of mine. And you get an idea that, hey, if we're talking about a Cenobacter, well, there's not many good options out there. There's no green category. And this just tells us the percentage of susceptibility. If I'm dealing with a Cenobacter, uh, I've got a couple options. Amicacin is probably my best, but it's not that effective. If it's going to treat roughly 84%, that still leaves that other percent of patients that it may not work on. But hey, if I'm looking at treating uh, Enterobacter, then I've got some really good effective things. Amicacin is 100% effective in those cases that have been tested. So that's definitely a really good agent. This kind of helps guide my clinical decision maker and may help guide the overall formulary recommendations for the whole hospital of why we sometimes change things. And some hospitals now are doing rotational therapy. So for this six months, we're using this agent and this agent to treat community acquired pneumonia. The next six months, we're gonna change drugs and try to limit exposure and so that we keep changing the antibiotics up that hopefully prevents some of the resistance that may develop in our region. So those are some of the things we're doing in some areas trying to combat this. But if you have an antibiogram, definitely look at it or ask, do we have one? How can this guide what I'm doing in my practice? So definitely things we want to consider when we're talking about prescribing antimicrobials. Definitely, how's it going to be given? Can this patient effectively swallow these medications? Are they going to need to have required either infusions every day or some type of parental administration? Always looking at their hepatic, their cardiac, and their renal function. Those are really important. If this drug is, say, a prodrug and it requires hepatic biotransformation and they have impaired liver function, this may not be a good agent. If we're looking for a drug that's going to be really effective in treating the urinary tract, 
how well is this drug excreted? Is it going to build up and lead to toxicity, or is it going to be very effective? If this patient's got heart failure, their volume overloaded, that's going to change the volume of distribution for this medication and may affect how effective it is at treating whatever we're trying to treat. Always ask about other medications the patient's on, including those over-the-counters, including those herbals, because definitely a lot of those can definitely impact biotransformation. They definitely can impact the therapeutic effect of some of these agents. As we talked about earlier, what is their immune status? If this patient is immunocompromised or has that risk, make sure we're using a cytal agent. If they're HIV and we don't know their CD4 count, we don't know what their viral load is, I'm gonna go on the side of this patient's immune suppressed, let's go with a cytal agent versus a static agent, just to make sure we're gonna treat that patient as effectively as possible. Some things we typically wanna to try to avoid in pregnancy, and definitely getting a history, getting that HCG will be important, but typically these are the agents we really try to avoid if this patient's pregnant. So like the aminoglycosides. Those can definitely have some significant renal impacts, but also can affect fetal development. The tetracyclines can definitely affect bone and teeth development. Tetracycline loves calcium. So we try to avoid that if at all in pediatrics, but also in OB patients. The fluoroquinolones. Lots of issues here lately, especially with soft tissue development, cartilage, tendon, but definitely those can affect fetal development as well. We try to use our sulfonamides or antivirals or antifungals very carefully. If we need to use those, then it's a risk and benefit model. We gotta treat mom to take care of the baby, but definitely look at those options. Consult with our OB providers if you need to, and they may have some great expertise in those areas also. Things we try to avoid with renal disease. We definitely have to think about adjusting their dose. Vancomycin is a big one. Most of us in the ED will start off with a gram. But ideally, it should be weight-based. And then after that, it's going to be based on renal function. What is their GFR? What do we need to do with this, with those peaks and troughs? Because definitely, if they have impaired renal function and they're not clearing this drug out fast enough, we don't want to cause toxicity. But definitely, the quinolones are another one. The aminoglycosides, those are huge renal hitters. We try to limit genomycin and amikacin for probably three to five days max, if at all possible. With those, hydration is really important, so we make sure we maintain renal perfusion. Most of us were starting them out and they're getting admitted. But those are things we definitely have to think about if this patient was recently admitted and now they're back and they have an acute kidney injury. We've got to choose another antibiotic, something to keep in mind. So now let's talk about our empirics for the rest of this section. So we talk about some of our H, E, E, and T stuff. So conjunctivitis typically is viral in most scenarios. So treatment really is going to be focused on just supportive care. But we usually go ahead and treat most of them as they're bacterial because we don't have culture and sensitivity results. And the risk of resistance from topical agents is very low. So if I think it's bacterial, definitely go ahead and treat it. If I'm not sure, probably go ahead and treat it. If it looks like a true allergic or viral conjunctivitis, then probably supportive care only. But just keep in mind that the risk of resistance from topical agents is pretty low. And so most people and most will recommend, go ahead and treat them. But definitely your big bugs are listed for you here, staph, H flu, streptococcus. Sometimes we'll see these in association with other things like sinusitis or otitis infections as well. Several good options out there like polymyxin B or trimethoprim. The quinolones are really important, especially for worry about pseudomonas. So if your patient's a contact lens wearer, they have some type of contact exposure, they have a corneal abrasion, or they have that ulceration, then the fluoroquinolones are definitely important there and the risk of systemic problems from the topicals is also pretty low. So I'd be more likely to use that with this patient versus using a quinolone to treat some simple infection. We're talking about systemic things. But with conjunctivitis, it simply goes back to good hand care, good eye care. They need to throw away their eye makeup, throw away their contacts, and not resume those until they've been symptom-free for probably three days after the infection's gone. If they go back to using them too quickly or use the same ones, they're going to get the infection right back. And just like everything else, hand washing is one of the best ways. It saves lives. We could all probably be better at it. So otitis media. And I'll go this a little bit more detail tomorrow in my talk on ear stuff. But there's some really good guidelines out there, about especially pediatrics and when we should watch and wait versus we should treat those. Most patients, it's usually viral also. Probably most people have recently had an upper respiratory infection, and now that's gotten eustachian tubes and got into the middle ear. 
if this is bacterial, your big culprits I've got listed for you, H flu, big one, strep pneumonia, M. cataralis, the typical bugs we see with a lot of our ENT infections. If it's bacterial or if we're highly concerned about bacterial infection, amoxicillin was our drug of choice for years, but it's been used a lot, so the resistance is pretty high. And so we see most of the recommendations now, so we should probably do higher dose amoxicillin, especially in kids, we're talking 80 to 90 milligrams per kilogram. That's a lot, and probably gonna have some GI distress with it. Between the antibiotic itself and also altering normal flora, that's common. If the patient's been recently treated for an ear infection, especially we talk about our kids, if they've been treated in the last six months, some will say up to a year, probably need to go ahead and consider they probably have resistance and go ahead and add something that's gonna cover those beta-lactamases, so using your augmentin, or maybe going to something else like a cephalosporin. If it's a kid, especially they have bilateral and they have high fevers, that's usually bacterial. Low-grade fever, one ear, most people recommend watch and wait. It's viral, supportive therapy. So fever control, pain control. Unfortunately, we lost a Ralgan. That antipyrine benzocaine was a great tool for treating that ear pain. No longer available, so we use other things like lidocaine or just acetaminophen and ibuprofen. But definitely we have other options out there. Macrolides are also good. But increased resistance in some areas because they've been used a lot. And typically, once we reach about 25 or 30% resistance in a region, that antibiotic is no longer effective. So otitis externa, a little different. See this a lot more in the summer months, spring, people using large bodies of water for recreational. The biggest culprit here usually is also pseudomonas. Our big risk factors, those of us that love our cotton tip swabs in the morning after in a shower, guilty this morning. But a lot of our earbud users now, hearing aid users, all that movement tends to remove the cerumen. Cerumen is protective as much as we don't want to think about how good earwax is, but they go in there and they abrade the wall, they go swimming, they get exposed to the microbes in the water, pseudomonas is a big one, and they get that localized external infection. Pain, swelling, lots of debris in the canal that we'll see. These are usually going to require only topical treatments, so something that usually has some kind of anti-pseudomonal coverage, probably also with a corticosteroid. So neomycin, polymix, and hydrocortisone. Very effective, fairly inexpensive. One of the things we have to consider though is that the neomycin sometimes can cause some contact dermatitis. So probably 20% of patients that use neomycin may develop a localized irritation. So that patient may come back and their ear is worse, it's more red, it's more erythemic and swollen. That may not necessarily be a worsening infection, it may just be the contact dermatitis from the neomycin. So just keep that in mind that neomycin can sometimes cause that. There are other things out there, some of our quinolones as you see listed there, but the cost can be pretty costly in some areas, depending on what your patient's resources are. Definitely if they've got a lot of edema, a lot of swelling, then an ear wick usually becomes very helpful if you're not used to using those. Get that wick in there to pull the medication down through the whole canal and usually allows it to resolve a lot faster. Ear wick stays in place until it falls out in the shower or the bath and they're usually much better. This usually doesn't need systemic treatment, usually topicals only. And a good focus on education. Always think about if you're worried about a TM rupture, it needs to be a suspension. Whether this is a traumatic perforation or could be from otitis and we're using external drops, always a suspension. The pH is more stable and tends not to cause as much harm to those internal structures. Our dental abscesses. Gotta love our dental patients that come in with their toothaches. And occasionally they have something going on. This is usually polymicrobial. And one of the nice things about a lot of these dental problems is penicillin still is pretty effective against most of them. So usually we can use our PenVK. If they have a large abscess formation, that makes me very concerned. They probably have an anaerobic infection. So we have to throw in something that's gonna treat those anaerobes, those pus formers. Clindamycin is a really good agent for treating anaerobic infections, so is metronidazole. One of the things we're worried about now with clindamycin is it's one of our big culprits now for causing C. difficile infections. Clindamycin is a really good agent for these. We use it a lot now for MRSA, but it's definitely one of our big culprits in causing some C. diff infections, so definitely something we need to think about with our patient education, giving them a little bit of informed consent for these patients. Pharyngitis. About 30% of 
pharyngitis that are bacterial are usually group A strep, and penicillin is still really effective against it as well. But this sometimes can be other culprits, and it may just be viral in some patients. But definitely if they're strep positive, then probably penicillin is going to be effective. A lot of debate, do we should be treating these patients? How worried are we now with scarlatina or some type of significant strep infection? Probably less of a concern nowadays than it was 50 years ago. So that some patients may do better with just observation, but probably most people still go ahead and treat them, whether it's the shot of bacillin or this couple day course of oral agents. If it's the peritonsor abscess, I've got that huge abscess on one side, usually unilaterally, I've got that uvular shift, makes me concerned. Several thoughts out there. Should we drain this or should we not? There's some really good techniques now with using ultrasound and going in there with a guarded needle and draining out some of that pus. But this usually is polymicrobial also. Clindamycin is a good option here. Maybe some of our systemic agents are going to give us some good broad spectrum coverage for these patients. There's been a couple studies that looked at just doing IV antibiotics only and no IND. And some of them actually showed pretty good resolution without doing any draining. So you may hear that talked about with some of our ENT colleagues. Hey, let's just try conservative therapy before we go stick a needle in it. So several options out there for that as well. So community-acquired pneumonia. Regional resistance definitely can play a role here. Definitely want to look at this. Is this truly community-acquired? Are they had any recent high-risk things? They've been admitted to the hospital? Have they been institutionalized? That may change this as well. We typically consider the nursing home patient to be their own community. So typically for most of those patients, it is truly a community-acquired infection. It's just a different group of bugs. We don't necessarily consider them to be hospital-acquired. So our big culprits here are your typical things, but sometimes also your atypicals. Most would say that macrolide is a good choice, azithromycin, but it's definitely got some increased resistance in some areas. So probably now a lot would say, hey, let's go with doxycycline. It's going to be a 10-day course or a 7-day course versus that nice little azithromycin rapid start path that we're used to, but definitely has a lower risk of resistance in most areas. Doxy can sometimes cause some GI distress. It does cause some photosensitivity in some patients, so definitely make sure we're educating them if they're planning a trip to the beach, and doxycycline may not be a good option. They're definitely going to need to use good SPF to definitely prevent some of that photosensitivity. If we're worried about our atypicals, that's when your things like the macrolides come in really good coverage. That patient has that typical walking pneumonia. They've got the cough, they've got the malaise, but nothing else. That may be your typical atypical presentation, and then macrolides usually have really good coverage for those. If they have comorbidities, they've got COPD, they're immune compromised, or something else, this is when we might consider the fluoroquinolones, or might consider something else with a little better beta-lactamase coverage. But definitely if it's your typical patient, got a pneumonia, looks like a pneumonia, but there's no high complications, there's no comorbidities, a fluoroquinolone should not be our first line agent. It should be reserved for those people that have comorbidities or other problems that may complicate this. For most people, probably azithro or macrolide is going to be just as effective as you go into a quinolone, as long as they're immune competent. How many are familiar with the CURB 65 score? Use it a lot in my practice as well, but can help guide you. And there's several other clinical decision tools out there. There's one called SmartCop, but really can help guide what does this patient need? Does this patient need to be admitted to the hospital or this can patient be managed outpatient? So definitely if you don't use those clinical decision tools, that may be good options to help you guide your care. One of the first things I'm talking to a hospital is to admit this patient, they're gonna ask, what's his CURB score? Hey, he's higher risk, he's hypoxic. This guy needs to come in. But you definitely can use that score to help guide your clinical decision making to decide, hey, is this patient safe for outpatient therapy or is this patient only need to be admitted because they're high risk? If we're dealing with the patient who now needs to be admitted to the hospital, they've got that community acquired pneumonia, but they need to come in, that patient probably treated at least with two agents. A macrolide like azithro to cover my atypicals and then probably a higher generation cephalosporin like ceftriaxone. So most of us, that patient comes in community acquired. Until I know the culprit, we're gonna give them those two agents. My most important thing here besides antibiotics is gonna be getting that sputum culture. And that's one of the, probably the worst things we're bad about getting collected from our patients, especially our nursing staff or getting respiratory to help us, is that sputum culture is really important. 
Most people that do not go to the ICU don't need blood cultures. Medicare has not changed their guidelines yet, but looking at the evidence, those blood cultures usually are just a waste. They're either cross-contaminated or they're negative. The sputum culture is what's really important to help us differentiate and narrow that spectrum down as soon as possible. But this definitely may be the patient I consider a quinolone as. So using our levoquin or amoxifloxacin. If they need to go to the ICU, they're hypoxic, they have other complications, this patient needs a little bit more broad spectrum coverage. And this is the patient I definitely might consider a respiratory quinolone. But I'm gonna weigh the risk and benefits of that. But definitely these are the patients that I have to worry about pseudomonas. And look at those risk factors. Who's at risk for pseudomonas? Those who are bedbound, those who've been admitted to a nursing home recently or had prolonged exposure to other things, those that have some comorbidities, they're immune compromised. They were intubated and ventilated weeks ago. Those are people that are higher risk for pseudomonas. And your quinolones have really good pseudomonal coverage. And I'll list some of the other agents here that have some decent pseudomonal coverage. We've got a whole class of antipseudomonal penicillins that tend to work very well for those patients as well. And now our hospital acquired patients. This patient was recently admitted to the hospital. Some will say 30, 60 days. Some will say up to 90 days, which you consider to be hospital acquired. So we gotta think about our typical infections because that patient easily could have picked up a pneumonia while they were out in the community, or it could be hospital stuff. So now I've definitely gotta worry about things like pseudomonas and MRSA. So most of the time we're gonna put them on a third or fourth generation cephalosporin. Someone's gonna get pseudomonas like our respiratory quinolones or carbapenem and go ahead and throw in the vancomycin to get their MRSA coverage until I get some cultures back. The goal here again is to narrow that spectrum as soon as possible. If I don't need three agents, let's take them away. Because some of these are gonna be big renal hitters and now we're just exposing that patient and changing their normal flora. So can we narrow that down? Definitely something that's gonna be helpful is to look back. What have they been on recently? If they were admitted here a month ago, what do they get then? What did their culture show? Was it MRSA or was it Pseudomonas or something else? And that may help guide some of my empiric therapy as well. They recently had this type of infection. Maybe I need to go ahead and think about treating that again, even though that may not be your typical pathogen we're worried about. Mycoplasma. As I mentioned earlier, the one antibody that doesn't have a cell wall. Most of this is gonna be referred quickly out to public health or epidemiology ID to treat those patients. Just kind of give you a refresh on the current recommendations is that patients that have active TB are gonna be treated with ripe therapy. They're gonna be on rifampin, INH, PZA, and ethambitol. Current recommendations are we should be doing DOT therapy, direct observational therapy. That patient comes in every day to the health department and somebody watches them swallow their pills. Typically they're gonna be on agents for probably three to six months. Most current recommendations are they're gonna start out on all four agents for three months. At the end of three months, if they're clinically better, they're gonna drop two of the agents and do at least two more agents for another three months for a total of six months of therapy. If you are non-compliant, the infectious disease group, public health has the ability to quarantine you to your home and institutionalize you. That's a public health hazard. In some areas, if you receive government assistance, that check stops showing up if you're non-compliant. That could be a big motivator in some areas. But multi-drug resistance TB is a huge problem and definitely something we wanna make sure that's being addressed properly. Because the big problem is most people are gonna start feeling better in a couple of weeks, a month or two, they're feeling better and they don't wanna take their pills. And then we get multi-drug resistance. Here's the current CDC recommendations for treating latent TB. Just wanna give you that information. People that are considered high risk looking at what their lab tests are and how we should treat those. So I just wanna give you that reference because we'll occasionally get those people that come in with latent TB. That's gonna be different than your active TB and probably gonna be one or two agents, but definitely follow up and working with ID or health department is gonna be really important for these patients to make sure they're gonna get followed through. So what about your asymptomatic bacteria? Patient comes in, we're screening, we're looking for whatever, we find bacteria in their urine, but they really have no symptomology. They're not complaining of anything. The current ISDA recommendations are we should not treat them unless they're pregnant or they're getting ready to undergo some type of urological instrumentation. They're getting ready to go have 
some type of procedure done, a cystoscopy, or they're pregnant, those are the ones we should treat. Otherwise, watch and wait. We shouldn't be putting people on antibiotics just because we find bacteria. Have them follow up in a week for repeat UA. So E. coli is our biggest culprit for most of our urinary tract infections. It's usually enteric. It's usually translocated from the GI to the GU tract in most patients. We know that females are higher risk than males. Good options out here. Nitrofurantin is still really effective for treating E. coli. Our sulfonamides, TMP, SMX, also very effective. Ceflexin may be a good option. Fluoroquinolone should not be a first-line agent for a non-systemic problem. If it's just a simple urinary tract infection, it should not be a fluoroquinolone. But in most people, nitrofurantin or TMP, SMX is gonna be good. If it's a pregnant patient, Cephalexin usually is our first line agent. If we've had to admit them or worry about things like pyelonephritis, now we've got to get think about more systemic coverage. And that might be the patient to think about using quinolone. But usually it's E. coli, but in some of our other patients it may be things like pseudomonas or protease, especially if they have an indwelling urinary catheter. So considering what agent is going to cover those. What's our big differing factor? What's going to help us figure out, is this a urinary tract infection or is this actually the patient who has pyelonephritis? What's going to be our big clinical findings? Usually the fever and the CVA tenderness. That's our two big textbook things. If they truly have a high fever, 102, 103, and they have CVA tenderness, that's pyelonephritis. If they can tolerate PO, we get their pain under control, they can probably go home unless they're pregnant. If they have pregnancy and pilo, that's almost always an admission. And in systemic antibiotics, ceftraxone is a good agent, has really good coverage for the urinary tract, and close follow-up to make sure, because these can cause some problems. But if they've got the fever, they've got the pilo with the CVA tenderness, can they go home or not? Depends on the differentials. So I've talked about this several times. So the quinolones, lots of black box warnings, lots of issues come out, lots of publications from the FDA about using those. Disabling potentially permanent side effects with soft tissue, tendon, ligaments, some neuropsychiatric problems, just recently some aortic vascular problems, acute dissections. Quinolone should not be our first line agents for simple infections, skin infections, urinary tract infections, non-complicated lung infections. And they're like this, reserved for use in patients who have no other treatment options. Most things we have other options, unless they're truly allergic to things, and that does sometimes narrow things down. But definitely, if you're using quinolones a lot, you're not familiar with these warnings, please look at them. There's a lot of stuff out there, and almost every month something new comes out. Oh, we found this with the fluoroquinolones. But definitely, if it's a simple infection, this should not be our first line agent, unless nothing else is an option. So kind of give you an idea of the timeline. Got these in 1962. Now, almost 60 years later, we're learning lots of stuff about them. The first box warning came out in 2008. And it gets worse, and it gets worse, and it gets worse. So share decision making. Inform your patient of these risks. You know, this drug could give you an aortic dissection. Definitely this patient's had a recent tendon injury or ligament or tendon repair. That's not the patient I want to prescribe a quinolone unless I have to. Topical agents, different. Systemic antibiotics, those are the ones that have the biggest risk. So our caudies. Definitely, we may play a role in these, thinking about when we place urinary catheters and we shouldn't. There's some really good evidence about certain patients that would benefit from a urinary catheter. Not all do. But definitely, this could be things like Pseudomonas or Klebsiella. Quinolones play a role here, but shouldn't be in my first line. So Piper Tazobactam is a good agent. Cefepime, Carbapenems are going to have also good coverage for most of these patients. A lot of these patients are just colonized. So is it truly an infection, or are they actually just colonized because they've had this catheter now for years? Are they symptomatic or not? There's no symptomology, probably we shouldn't treat them. They're colonized, we're not going to get it cured. But definitely just keep that in mind that your typical UTI treatments are going to be different than your patient who has a catheter-associated urinary tract infection. And then our sexually transmitted infections. 
In the US, chlamydia is our first, most common, followed by gonorrhea. Current recommendations are for presumptively treating, we should always treat for chlamydia and gonorrhea together. If you have the ability to get your results back within an hour or two, then that definitely may be an option to wait and not presumptively treat everybody. If you're treating for gonorrhea, currently ceftraxone is our most effective agent. If you're treating for just gonorrhea itself, the recommend are, recommendations are to treat with ceftraxone and azithromycin due to the risk of resistance. If we're treating presumptively, we're always giving them the ceftriaxone and the azithro because we're treating for both chlamydia and gonorrhea. But if you had the results back and it's just gonorrhea, they still recommend giving them both. If we're treating for just chlamydia, then it's going to be azithromycin. Now, if you trust them to take pills for seven days, you can send them home with Dotsy. But I'm a little jaded. If I can't trust them to use condoms and safer sex practices, I'm not sure they're going to take pills for seven days. And most of the guidelines say DOT, direct observational therapy. They come in, they get their ceftraxone injection, they get their dose of azithro, and we're done. Trichomonas, metronidazole is still our first line agent for these and very effective. And they also still recommend the DOT. Give them that two grams of azithro there in the ED. Definitely making sure we educate them about the concerns with, with giving metronidazole. They should not consume any ethanol for at least the next week or two. Most recommendations are they shouldn't take alcohol a couple days before and up to a week after their last dose. We usually don't have the luxury of, hey, hey come back in three days and we'll give you your azithro, I mean your um, metronidazole, but definitely keep that in mind and educate the patient. They tend to cause that disulfram-like reaction, and they thought that they ever had nausea and vomiting bad, wait till it's metronidazole induced. And some people, even the slight taste of a little bit of wine in communion was enough to put them into that nausea and vomiting. If you've never encountered the luxury of treating a patient for chlamydia, gonorrhea, and trichomonas, all those pills at one time tend not to set well in the stomach. So definitely consider an antiemetic, maybe space them out, give them something to eat between them. But I've seen multiple people that come in from the health department because they got all of it and they started puking. It's a lot of azithro, a lot of metronidazole in the stomach. So definitely consider then an antiemetic or something to eat. That tends to help. So PID, outpatient, yeah, may be a good option, especially if they're not severely symptomatic, they're not having a ton of circumotion tenderness, they're able to take in PO, then outpatient therapy may be appropriate. But definitely if they have significant complications or they're having a high fever or they have to worry about developing an abscess, then maybe the patient needs to come in for systemic antibiotics parenterally. PID can have some significant complications if not treated. Definitely can lead to abscess formation. Definitely can increase the risk of having ectopic pregnancies. Sometimes they can develop a significant hepatic complication with this as well. So definitely it's important to recognize it and treat it. And this patient definitely needs a follow-up quickly as well, probably within a week to make sure they've got resolution. Syphilis, still a common STI we're running to. And in some areas, there's been a significant rise in cases of syphilis. Luckily, penicillin is still very effective at treating any type of syphilis we run into. So primary syphilis, that's your canker. Secondary syphilis, that's the rash that usually develops after the canker has resolved. Sometimes we'll see latent syphilis. So that's your patient who has a positive test but has no history of a canker or the rash. So if it's early latent versus late latent depends upon when we think the exposure was, Penicillin is still effective, but as you see, it can be a large dose. And then if it's neurosyphilis, we're going to be treating them with penicillin and usually adding in something like probenicid. Probenicid is just going to increase the reabsorption of the penicillin in the renal tubules so it has a longer half-life. And usually we're definitely involving ID with these patients, but definitely if we're treating any of these levels, it's going to be penicillin. If they truly have late latent or neurosyphilis, they often recommend that we try to desensitize these patients against penicillin and use it. But ceftriaxone may be effective in some other agents in those patients who cannot get penicillin. But not every patient is going to come in with a rash. Not every patient is going to come in with the canker, so definitely our labs may help us with that. So some of our non-sexually transmitted infections. So bacterial vaginosis isn't an STI but it does increase the risk of getting sexually transmitted infections in females. It's just an alteration in the normal flora of the vaginal area. 
So we're going to treat it with metronidazole. This is going to require a seven-day course, not that direct observational therapy dose. That's not going to be effective. If she's pregnant, then definitely BV needs to be treated because this definitely can cause complication with a developing fetus. And definitely if she's nearing term, that definitely can lead to problems during delivery as well. Vulval candidiasis, just an overgrowth of candida. It's one of those super infections we sometimes deal with. For most patients, topicals that are over the counter are gonna be effective if they're not a one-time dose of an azo like ketoconazole is usually very effective in treating that. Some patients are higher risk than others, especially if they're on current antimicrobial therapy. There is some evidence that using probiotics may reduce the risk of developing a vaginal candida infection when taking antibiotics. So GI coverage, talking about prophylaxis. For most things, cefoxitin or cefotetan is gonna be a good agent. It's gonna cover a lot of our GI normal flora. So that patient who's going, we think they've got an appy, that may be a good option. But we definitely can use other agents, like the carbapenems are gonna have good coverage. Some of our pipotazobactam has good coverage. Zosin, unison, those tend to cover very well. If it's complicated, if they're already showing systemic problems, we're worried about peritonitis, we probably should go ahead and add in metronidazole to cover those anaerobes. We see a lot of anaerobic growth in the GI and the GU tract because it's without oxygen, and so definitely metronidazole is a very good option there. Several recommendations here for diverticulitis. There's even been discussion about maybe we shouldn't even treat it with antibiotics, just do supportive therapy, but most of the general consensus is still go ahead and treat them with something to cover either our anaerobes and our normal flora. So whether it's a quinolone plus metronidazole, or pipotazo or ticacillin clavulanate. Depends on formulator, depends on what you've got, what's effective for the patient. C. diff I've alluded to several times, definitely a growing problem with super infections. Now it's also community acquired in some areas. We're having patients come in with C. diff infections who have not been on any antibiotics and they've required it community acquired. The current recommendations are is vancomycin PO. It used to be start with metronidazole and then go to vanco, but now ISDA recommends we go to vanco PO. If vanco PO is not an option or available, then we can try metronidazole. Vancomycin PO is not cheap. And there's actually a couple studies I've looked at that using systemic IV vanco by mouth is just as effective and a lot less expensive. Vancomycin is not absorbed in the GI tract. It's only going to have its effect there in the GI tract. So definitely, if you have it available, either oral vanco or having them drink vanco is going to be just as effective. But metronidazole is another option if we can't do the vancomycin PO. Lots of discussion out there about treating repeated uh, C. diff infections that definitely doing fecal microbiota transplants is definitely going to be an option in some of those areas, and in some patients, that's definitely what they're gonna need. Not usually our first line in the ED with those patients we need to consider getting GI involved if they've had repeated G CDI infections and getting them treated with a light line of treatment involving ID. As I mentioned several times, there's some really growing evidence that doing prebiotics may be effective in preventing C. diff infections, but also other super infections associated with using antibiotics. If the patient's not immune compromised, then recommend they take some prebiotics. It's probably appropriate. Look at the literature, decide what you want. There's actually even probiotics now that we may consider, as well as the prebiotics and using those in those patients. Some growing literature that may be helpful. If we're talking about traveler's diarrhea, probably TMP-SMX is gonna be a good option. If we're talking about some type of infectious diarrhea, that person who comes in with bloody stools, fever, and that's definitely going to have to worry about some of those enteric infections that may have picked up somewhere else. Then azithro plus saftraxone or a quinolone is a good option. Those are definitely the patients we probably do not want to recommend antidiarrheals with. They need to be evaluated and treated. Most will say that, hey, we shouldn't recommend antidiarrheals at all because it just delays the inevitable. As bad as diarrhea is, it's the body's way of getting out whatever it is but definitely if they're having bloody diarrhea, we should not recommend antidiarrheals. They need evaluation because this probably is a true bacterial infection. Bismuth, which is in Pepto, a couple of the other over-the-counter GI preps, they have some really good 
antimicrobial coverage and may help with some of those patients as well. If you're traveling outside the country, Pepto is a good thing to take with you. Just to prove last year, as we have a new agent now, rifamycin for treating traveler's diarrhea. It does have a higher cost, but it's shown to be very effective in treating if somebody has that traveler's diarrhea. Very similar other drug that's going to be similar to it. It's off-label, but as you can see with GoodRx, a little over $2,000. This is when your ID people, or if you have a travel clinic, comes in really good hand to call those up and ask them. So skin and soft tissue infections, what used to be our typical bugs, Staph aureus, Strep pyogenes, uh, not always our typical bugs anymore. Typically if it's an abscess, that's almost always Staph. If it doesn't have an abscess, it's just the redness, just the erythema, as soon as they start having red streaks, that's more likely to be Strep. But those are usually our two biggest ones. Recommendations here, if they have cellulitis, typical things like penicillin or maybe some type of Penicillin A is resistant penicillin. What we usually deal with nowadays is mostly that cutaneous abscess. For years we were taught just IND is all they need unless there's a significant amount of cellulitis. But looking at a lot of the newer evidence that probably they have a cutaneous abscess, there is improved resolution and reduced reoccurrence if we do the IND and a short course of antibiotic therapy. For most people nowadays, our culprit is MRSA. They've got community-acquired MRSA. Not all those spider bites that we see, or at least I see a lot of the spider bites. The MRSA spider gets a lot of bad rap. I don't know about y'all, but he does. But definitely look at this one study that found that we had improved resolution with a number needed to treat of only seven. That's pretty good. So definitely if you're usually just doing an IND, maybe considering a short course, five to seven days, may be beneficial in those patients. But definitely if they have an abscess, and they have a complicated cellulitis with it, we definitely should consider antimicrobial therapy along with the IND. TMP SMX still has really good coverage in most areas for MRSA. Clinda's a good option. They can't take a sulfonamide, but Clinda now is one of our big culprits in causing C. diff infections in some patients. In some areas, tetracycline is still effective. It has really good susceptibility. And if we need to, we can go with systemic vanco for those systemic problems, but typically one of the other oral agents will be first line for most of us. I found Tetra actually pretty well in most patients and tolerated pretty well besides some of the GI distress it causes. So how long should we can put them on antibiotic therapy? What's the recommendations? So this was last year, they looked at 23 randomized control trials. What's the effect? What's the big recommendation? And they found that shorter durations were as effective as longer duration therapy in most patients. So for some stuff, five days may be all they need versus a seven or 10 day course. Probably with a shorter course, we probably have better compliance. So at five days, they're feeling better and there's no more to take, they're probably gonna be finishing that course versus saving those last couple of days just in case they need them later. It's amazing how many people do that. They wanna save those last three or four days just in case they need them later. And that's where we see a lot of the resistance problems. For uncomplicated cystitis, one day of phosmomycin or three days of TMP-SMX is just as effective as a longer course of therapy. For your female patient with an uncomplicated cystitis, they only need three days. Five days if you're doing nitrofurantin. Not 10 days, not 14 days. And for skin and soft tissue infections, that probably seven days if they've got an abscess, if it's just cellulitis, no complications, probably five days. So definitely we've rethought this whole duration of therapy and knowing that probably shorter courses are just as effective in most patients may improve compliance and decrease our risk of resistance in some areas. CNS infections, meningitis, our best agent here is gonna be ceftraxone. Ceftraxone has really good penetration of the CNS. Even if the blood-brain barrier is not inflamed, ceftraxone can still penetrate and enter the CNS. Most antibiotics cannot get in the CNS unless the blood-brain barrier is damaged. Ceftraxone doesn't have to worry about that. If we're worried about pneumococcal, we probably need to add in some vanco. Otherwise, for H flu or typical meningeal problems, probably ceftraxone is enough. 
if it's our neonate, our corpus is going to change. We should be still using AMP and GENT. For post-exposure prophylaxis, you're exposed, family members exposed, dorm mates exposed. If we start chemical prophylaxis within 24 hours of the exposure, usually it's very effective at reducing the risk of that person developing meningitis. So a dose of Cipro, a dose of rifampin, or they just want to, or you just want to give it to them, an injection of ceftriaxone is also effective. But for most people, that single dose of Cipro or rifampin is all they're going to need to prevent contracting that bacterial infection. Current guidelines for sepsis vary kind of regionally, but typically this patient probably should be on at least vancomycin, a beta-lactam, and something that's going to cover pseudomonas if not already addressed. So a carbapenem or a fluoroquinolone. For most areas, it's going to be those three agents initially, and then we're going to tailor that as we move across. But definitely something that may vary. Definitely look at your hospital. If you have a pharmacy and therapeutics committee or ID recommends, it may vary. And it definitely, ideally in most people, vancomycin should be weight-based, not just the standard one gram for our initial dose. And then, obviously, inpatient-wise, they're going to adjust that based on renal function. But if you have a very large patient, one gram may not cover them effectively. So definitely think about weight base for that initial dose in those patients. So influenza. We're definitely in that time of the season. In some areas now, it's not considered to be seasonal with influenza. It's considered to be year-round. It never stops anymore. It used to peak and would fall off, but now we see cases even in the summer months in some areas. Our neuramidase inhibitors are our first-line recommendations. If we're doing acute treatment or prophylaxis, it may be something like relenza or Tamiflu. Prophylaxis, and I've listed here who they recommend we treat, only for those that are high risk. And on the next slide, we'll look at who high risk is. But your typical person who has influenza or has been exposed to influenza probably does not need to be on antivirals. It's supportive therapy, and let's save the antivirals for those who need them. Us, healthcare providers, are high-risk patients, especially those who are immune compromised or those who are pregnant. We do have a couple of newer agents out now for acute treatment, Zofluza, and we have Rapavap, which can be given IV, that may be indicated for people who have acute influenza that are hospitalized, especially they also have a pneumonia or they have other type of disease process. Those patients probably need to be treated. So this is who ISDA and also supported by CDC says probably should be treated or if they're exposed should have prophylaxis. Your extremes of age, you're very young, your older patients over 65, those under the age of 19 are on long-term aspirin therapy. This is not really well understood, but thought to sometimes do with the uh, anti-inflammatory properties of aspirin, but definitely those patients are higher risk. Those of Native American descent, including our Alaskans, or Inuits, they're higher risk, thought to be genetic influence there. Patients who are pregnant and up to two weeks postpartum, those with significant comorbidities, which includes obesity, those are higher risk patients, especially if they have diabetes, they have COPD, they have some type of lung disease. Long-term care residents and those that we admit with some type of pulmonary tract or pulmonary tree infection, those are the ones we really should be treating. Most of our patients, it's supportive care. If you look at a lot of the literature, what does giving them Tamiflu do? It reduces their course by about 23 hours. For most people, one day is not going to make a huge difference. We probably should save those antivirals for those who need them. And they're not without risk. They're going to have some GI distress. There are some neuropsychiatric problems that sometimes develop in people who take some of the neuraminase inhibitors. But definitely, as we're getting in that time, think about who needs antiviral treatment and who doesn't. It's not every patient. So herpes zoster, patient comes in, they've got the outbreak. Sometimes this takes a couple of days for the shingles to actually show up. Classic presentation is pain in an area, and then a couple of days later they'll start out with the vesicles and the outbreak shows up. But definitely so within 72 hours of the onset, antivirals are very effective at slowing down the process. They definitely help with the pain to some extent. They usually help prevent further expansion especially this is on the face or near the eyes, those patients need close follow-up and close observation. For most patients with shingles, they're not contagious unless it's disseminated or if they have significant 
immunocompromised states, that may increase the risk of being transmittable. Usually it's only the fluid from the vesicles we have to worry about. But if they're immunocompromised, they have disseminated shingles, it should be treated always, no matter the duration. Post-exposure prophylaxis. A couple things we run into, if you're exposed to pertussis or your patient, family member is, azithromycin is really effective again within 24 hours. Diphtheria, azithro also works, we could use penicillin. Tick-borne illnesses, it's usually gonna be doxy, unless they're highly allergic, then we're gonna do amoxicillin. Most of the recommendations say we shouldn't treat prophylactically for a tick-borne illness unless they're in a high-risk area. If they live up in Connecticut and they get a tick bite, that's the person I might consider treating for Lyme disease prophylactically. Because we know that Lyme disease can have some complications significantly over a course of time. But most recommendations say, let's watch and wait. But if they come in with a rash, they come in with a fever, the myalgias, and I'm worried about tick-borne illness, that's the person I'm gonna start on doxy, get my labs and follow through. If we can't use doxy, then amoxicillin, but doxy is our first line. Even in pregnancy, doxy is the first line. Looking at tetracyclines, tetracycline is the biggest concern, doxy is not. And especially if I'm worried about Rocky Mountain spotted fever, doxy is more effective at treating it than amoxicillin. Endocarditis, anthrax. Hopefully we never have to deal with it, but Cipro or doxy are good agents. We have stockpiles of Cipro across the country for a lot of our biological events. So if there is one, we can break out those stockpiles and rapidly treat as many people as possible. Mammal bites. First line usually is gonna be augmentin. It's gonna cover the typical pathogens we see there. Think about your mammal bites, who's highest risk? It's the human bites. 90 plus percent of those patients are gonna get infected, especially if it's the fight bite. They punch somebody in the face, they get those breaks in the skin from the teeth, that's gonna be your higher risk. Cats, dogs, in that order. Dogs are the least risky, but usually cause a lot more tissue trauma. Hepatitis A, last year we had a significant outbreak of Hep A across the country. The nice thing about Hep A is we do have immune globulin available. We also have the two-step vaccine available. So if definitely someone's exposed or start developing symptomology, we can treat them. Hep B, if they haven't been vaccinated, we can do the Hep B immune globulin and administer the vaccine. Rabies. Our highest risk animals for rabies, non-domesticated animals. Foxes, raccoons, skunks, bats. Any contact with a bat, they recommend prophylaxis. You wake up and find a bat in your house, they recommend prophylaxis. Bats have such small teeth that they may not be able to locate the bite mark. If you get bit by a domesticated cat or dog, the risk of rabies is very low in this country, not other countries. But if it's a high-risk bite, we're gonna recommend the rabies immune globulin, which is weight-based, and then the vaccine. We're gonna have the four doses of the vaccine. If we're doing the rabies immune globulin, the recommendations are to try to administer half of the rig in and around the bite if possible. Now, if this was on a finger, that's gonna be kind of hard to do, but if they're on a limb, we're gonna inject as much of that rig as possible in and around the bite. Prophylaxis is very effective within the first six days of the bite. After the bite, if it's been seven to 10 days and they develop symptomology, it's usually fatal. There's only six documented cases of people that have survived rabies. It is fatal. But in the U.S., it's very rare compared to other countries. Tetanus. If someone has a tetanus-prone wound and they've not been vaccinated properly, or they've not had at least three shots in a series, they should get the tetanus immune globulin, plus we start the vaccine. If they've been vaccinated like most people and it's been more than five years, they probably just need a booster. For most people, unless it's seven to 10 years, they're good. If it's a highly contaminated wound, especially that involves dirt or manure, those are high risk wounds. So we see most of our tetanus grows in the dirt and the manure. If we're actually treating tetany, then it's gonna be benzos for the muscle spasms and penicillin is usually our first line antibiotic. Things that we don't see a whole lot, but definitely we're seeing more and more uh, with the um, lack of vaccinations in some patient populations or under vaccination. But we also know that not every patient who gets vaccinated will develop immunity, unfortunately. So HIV post-exposure prophylaxis. 
current really good guidelines about who we should treat and what the risk is. If it's blood-to-blood -blood contact, like hollow bore needle to blood, that's a high-risk exposure. Splash to intact skin or even to the face, that's lower risk. We need to look at the risk. And there's really good algorithms that help us decide who's high risk and not. But within 72 hours, we can start uh, prophylaxis, use it for four weeks, and then we follow up test at four to six weeks, then usually at six months and 12 months. There also is PrEP, if you're not familiar with the term PrEP, that we do have patients who are high risk, maybe on PrEP, which was Truvada, and now there's another version as well that has less side effects. But if you encounter patients who are just taking Tenovavir and nothing else with this combination, they're probably on PrEP, and that's people that have lifestyles that are higher risk for HIV. IV drug users, those who have sex with men, or those who have partners who are HIV positive. So you will see people that are on PrEP, for, prof for prophylaxis. And then lastly, our ectoparasites. Those things that we love so much. They come in with that itching and that scratching. And as soon as you see it on the board, you start itching and scratching too. Like, no. But pediculosis. There's several good options out there for treating pediculosis. In most patients, the over-the-counter options are just as effective as the prescription options. But definitely things to look at. The ability to, for this to be effective varies upon whether it's an oocyte or not. Some of these don't tr kill the eggs, they require two treatments. Some kill the eggs, they just require one treatment. And it's important for the patient to read the labels and know, hey, is this a apply for five minutes or is this apply for an hour and then bathe? If we're talking about scabies, permethrin cream is one we use mostly, but we definitely have lindane as well. Scabies is that classic burrowing between the web spaces. We do have some oral agents out there like ivermectin that can be used, especially if nothing else is working. But for most people, topicals work very well. Just remember, we also have to treat part of their living environment, their bedding, their clothing. If we're talking about kids, their stuffed animals need to be treated. Otherwise, they're going to get the infection right back. But definitely in winter months, this is common in our children because of heavy coats, and they're all put together somewhere during the day, and it transmits over. This is just a, a table that I found very helpful. This is uh, published in journal feed. Some of my colleagues at Vanderbilt do this as a weekly and also a daily update. But found this kind of just a good way to quickly look back at drugs and see what covers what. So I gave you that as well as the link to that uh, website. Any questions about antimicrobial therapy? I hope that wasn't too mundane, but thinking about what works for what areas. Yes. The alternative treatment for penicillin for, for diarrhea, for treating diarrhea, like traveler's diarrhea? Gonorrhea, sorry. So if they're penicillin allergic, the current recommendation is trying the azithro plus genomycin. Genomycin is our backup for now treating gonorrhea. Yes. So time frame, the goal is to initiate antivirals within 48 hours, that after 48 hours, there's probably not as much benefit. But if they're admitted or they're high risk, we should go ahead and administer antivirals no matter the, direct, the exposure, but ideally within 48 hours. So the question was for pyelonephritis for ceftriaxone. Usually it's the one gram, and they're usually probably getting that for at least three to five days, plus something else, usually either TMP, SMX, or a quinolone, or one of the other agents that'll cover those bacteria. Usually it's a gram a day for the first three to five days. But also, if they're getting better and they're only in the hospital for 23, 48 hours, they may only need that one or two doses. But they're probably gonna go home with oral agents probably at least 10 days, depending on the bacteria. <laughs>